This is the pre-lab for ELISA. I've got ELISA up here. It's not a Z, even though I say it, so it sounds like it. E-L-I-S-A. It's an acronym. This is in the protocol you've already read, but I want to put it up here for extra clarity. Enzyme, linked, immunoabsorbent assay. That's where the letters come from. Translate that into something easier. This is an antibody-based test. Antibody-based tests are used a lot to test for different things. Are they used to test for infectious diseases? Absolutely. If you go to the doctor, they take a throat swab and do a rapid strep test, that is an antibody-based test. You buy a pregnancy test, that is an antibody-based test. Now, the beauty of an antibody-based test is why it works. Is because antibodies are very specific. Antibodies are made by our immune system and other animals too. Other mammals have immune systems. Antibodies are protective proteins that are made by our immune systems. Antibodies are very specific. They bind specifically to their target, and the target is called an antigen. So, in your body, say a virus came in, your immune system's activated. Unit four, we talk about first line of defense, second line of defense. Antibodies are made by the third line of defense third line of defense, more specifically the B cells. So you get a B cell activation, get an army of B cells, they are cranking out antibodies. Antibodies are usually depicted as capital letter Ys. And I have a simple little drawing of an antibody right here for us to refer to. Antibodies have two binding sites. Those binding sites are specific for a particular antigen. So if your immune system was activated and antibodies are being produced, they have very specific receptors on the antibodies that are binding for antigens, say it's a virus. You're infected with a virus, your immune system's activated. The antibodies produced in response to that infection by your B cells are specific for binding that particular virus, okay? Now because the antibody antigen reaction, so I'm gonna put an antigen here. Let's just make it, it a funny shape, all right? So the black is an antigen. This letter Y is the antibody. Let's label it up here. So the basis of any antibody-based test is the specificity of antibody to antigen binding, specific binding, all right? So if you can come up with a test that allows you to detect if antigen antibody binding happened, now you've got a specific test. So if you have an antibody specific for something and you want to test for it, you can do so. And it's going to be an antibody-based test and it may specifically be an ELISA test. Now in the big picture, human blood typing, A, B, A, B, and O, those tests are antibody-based tests. So antibodies are used to detect if the A protein, the B protein, or both the A and B protein, or neither the A and B protein, are present. So that's an antibody-based test. All right. More about ELISA. Oh, let me talk about this first. This is a simulated ELISA experiment that we are going to do today. We have modified the story, the scenario, to make it for the current new coronavirus outbreak, to make it even more relevant to you. 
So our simulation today is going to be testing for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So in order to do an ELISA test for this virus, we need to have antibodies that are specific for the virus. Okay? We can get antibodies from mice and rabbits. We could get antibodies from humans. But as long as you've got antibodies that are specific, you can do an antibody-based test. So now over to here. There are two types of ELISA, indirect ELISA and direct ELISA. I've read some about the testing for this novel coronavirus, and I've read about both. So we're going to talk about both, and I want you to learn about both in this experiment. If one is doing an indirect, uh, indirect ELISA, how, what would they be doing and how would they be doing it? They'd most likely be taking a blood sample from a patient. And they're testing the blood for the presence of antibodies specific for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. All right? Now, if the patient's been exposed to the virus and their immune system has been activated, specifically the third line of defense and the B cells, then they'll have antibodies in their blood. So this we might need to allow some days, okay? Because we're testing not directly for the virus presence in the body, but for the antibodies against the virus, okay? So that would be an indirect test. So what we're looking for in the patient in an indirect is patient-produced antibodies specific for a particular infectious agent in this case. You can also test for the antigen, in this scenario, the virus. So you can use an ELISA test to either test for antibodies in the patient which indicate the infections occurred, or you could test for the specific virus in this case. Is it present? Now, you could do a blood sample. You could do a saliva sample. They're doing oral and nasal swabs. So that material can be used to do a direct ELISA. So in those cases, those swabs are used to do direct ELISA to see if the swabs contain the antigen. So you need to have the specific antibody. You need to have the specific stuff going anyway, but you've got to have the specific antibody and you can test for in a patient sample the presence of the virus directly. Okay? All right. Dr. Cheney, anything else I might want to say? All right. So, in your student protocol, I think you're good. student page three has a very nice picture, and the study guide does encourage you to be very familiar with this picture for the lab practical. So I am going to talk you through my version of the picture step by step. So tests like this are done in multi-well plates, which you've probably seen on the TV news, and you will see in the next segment where we do the ELISA, the simulated ELISA. This picture, I've got one giant well of a multi-well plate, okay? Now I'm going to put the stuff in here as we do it in the experiment. So in this case, we've got a multi-well plate. We've got multiple samples. And I'm just going to show you what's going on in one well. So the first step is to add antigen. I'm going to grab the directions. Imagine that. So step one, we put, this is all simulated, antigen. All right. So if we're putting antigen in, the antigen 
is expected to stick to the plastic walls of these wells. So I'm drawing it as a semicircle. It sticks to the bottom as well as the sides. Okay. So in this case, what is the antigen? Is something from the virus itself. Okay. So that means we're testing for antibodies. So the type of ELISA that's actually being done in our simulation is indirect ELISA. So antigen, and we're going to label it so you can track. Antigen solution is put into the wells. This was real little ELISA. There would be an incubation to give the antigen time to stick. Then the solution would be dumped out. Rinses would be done so that we're sure the only antigen remaining in the well is stuck to the well. Okay. Step two. Oh, we've got positive control, negative control. I'm not going to do this. We're going to pretend this is a sample. So now I'm going down to step four. Step four is adding the patient sample. So when patient sample is put in here, could be blood or another body fluid that we'd expect to find antibodies in. What we're testing for is, are there any antibodies that will stick to the antigen? I'm gonna draw these antibodies in green. They're letter Y's. You'll notice I flipped them upside down because the binding sites are on the tippy tops of the Y's. They can bind more than one thing because there's two binding sites. So they could be binding to one antigen molecule. They could be binding to more than one. All right? So at this step, the solution, which is the patient sample, is put in, incubated, gentle shaking, and if there's antibodies that will stick to the virus, they're going to stick. Then we wash out the solution, do some washes so that we are pretty darn sure that only the antibodies that are stuck to antigen are remaining in the well. Okay. So now I'm going to label the green, I'll put it upside down, that is our primary antigen in this experiment. Primary antibody. Sorry. <laughs> primary antibody. Thank you, Dr. G. So we've got antigen, primary antibody. Now, can we see what's going in the wells yet? Absolutely not. It looks like we're putting in clear fluids, washing out clear fluids. So we've got to have a trick so we can visualize if there really was an antibody in the patient sample. So we're going to continue onward. The next step. After the patient sample, where it's stepped, oh, we gotta go through all those patient samples. 10. Now, we're introducing a secondary antibody. The secondary antibody will stick to the primary antibody. Okay? Now, if this is human antibody, we could have a secondary antibody that sticks to human antibodies. And we're going to change the color, and I'm going to add some of this in here. So we've got secondary antibody binding. It's still an antibody. It's got two binding sites. They could be to one molecule. They could be to two. So the secondary antibody is binding to the primary antibody. Got a few more antibodies in here in the picture of the protocol. Now, what can happen, I think I've got it decently represented. You got a certain number of primary antibodies there. You can get more than that number of secondary antibodies sticking to the primary antibody. 
So the secondary antibody in red, that's for short, secondary, can amplify the signal because we can have more of the secondary antibody molecules than we had of the primary. Now we still can't see anything in the tube. It still looks clear. The trick is that the secondary antibody, let's give ourselves a little picture here. The secondary antibody has an enzyme stuck to it. to be blue yet and change it back to black. So we get an enzyme represented by the star that is stuck to the primary antibody. So there's an enzyme for every antibody molecule. I think I got them all. Gotta come back to the name. Enzyme linked. The secondary antibody is enzyme linked. Okay? Immunoabsorbent, we're getting things to stick together, and it's an antibody or immune test. Right? So, the very last step of an ELISA test is to add what's called a chromogen. Right. I wanted to have a color just for that, chrome and chip. So, the star, oh, let's keep it in black. The black star is the antibody. We add the chromogen, and then we get a color change. So the last step of an ELISA is to add the solution that has the chromogen. Incubate it for a little while so it gets a chance to meet up with these enzymes. Now a chemical reaction occurs and we get a color change. We get rid of these loose ones. And the solution that's in here is going to go from being a clear solution to a blue solution. A little messy at the end. But the enzyme linkage is key. We have an enzyme, we can provide it a substrate, which is simply a chemical, that it can change into a color chemical. So we have chromogen. Patient sample in this case did have the primary antibody. If primary antibody is in the patient sample, then the secondary antibody in red has something to stick to. Secondary antibody is linked to an enzyme, the black stars. Now we got it set up so we can get a change if there was primary antibody. You're only going to get secondary antibody stuck if there's primary antibody. Otherwise, when the solution's dumped out and rinsed, you don't have any of the red secondary antibody. Then when you add the chromogen, you don't get a color change. In this case, we added the chromogen, met up with the enzyme, we got the blue color change, which indicates a positive result for ELISA. And in this particular indirect ELISA simulation, this said that the patient had antibodies specific for the SARS-CoV-2, which means they've been exposed to the virus. And not just exposed, there's been enough of the virus in their system to activate their immune system. Okay? And that's the ELISA test.
And we are now going to do the ELISA experiment. No blue gloves, we're not working with any cultures, and this is a simulated experiment, so no gloves are necessary. I'm going to be following the directions on the student protocol, which you have been asked to print, so you know what I'm looking at. So, step one. Using one of these plastic pipettes, I'm going to put three drops of antigen. So this is our simulated antigen. I don't know if we really need that. Simulated antigen, rows A and B, three drops each. That's one row. Now, as I mentioned in the pre-lab discussion, if we were doing this for real, this would go on a shaker table for some time. Right now, the antigen is sticking to the sides of those plastic wells. And then, the antigen would be dumped out and several rinses would be done. But with a simulated kit, we don't need to do all of that. So, we can proceed to step number two. Clean pipette, and we're gonna put the actual samples in. So they're lined up here. First, I have the positive control. I always need to have control so you know your experiment's working properly. And I'm doing three drops. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So the first three wells. Yeah, here we go. We got the picture on the back of the handout. Just put the positive controls in one, two, three. Now the negative control is going in three, four, five of row A. One, two, three. Negative controls in. Now, we're moving on to the patient samples, which are here. Same thing, we're doing three wells for each. That gives more credibility to our test. So we're doing this in triplicate. Three wells for each. All right, so patient A is going in seven, eight, and nine. A, put aside. Patient B is going into 10, 11, and 12. 10, 11, 12. So as you can see, this is a little tedious. I imagine that this type of testing has been automated in some of the major labs. Okay, so I am on C. I'm double checking the picture. C is in one, two, three. Three, one, two, three, one, two, three. It's very important that I don't cross-contaminate any of the wells. Don't wanna cross-contaminate the patient samples. So now I've got patient D going into four, five, and six. Four, yeah, one more. 
Okay, that was patient D. Fresh pipette. 789 will be patient E. So 7, 8, 9. Put a little more, but that'll be fine. And I'm to the last patient sample. So I'm double checking. It is indeed labeled F. It's going to be in 10, 11, and 12. Some more. Oops, getting a little messy here. That should do it. So the key thing was no contamination. Now, all of these samples, this was a real ELISA test, there'd be an incubation with gentle shaking, then the liquid would be dumped out and washes would be done, but we don't have to do that for this simulation. We are now in the protocol to step 10. So, I'm getting the secondary antibody that we've talked about. So, ooh, yeah, let's back up a bit. So, all those samples that went in, may or may not contain antibody for what we're testing for, the coronavirus. So the antibody that was in the patient samples, or maybe not in, that's the primary antibody. So that should be stuck to the antigen that's stuck to the wells. At this step, we're adding secondary antibody. Secondary antibody is gonna stick to the primary but there should only be primary in here, if this was a real ELISA, if it's stuck to the wells. One, two, three, 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 one, two, three. Let me get some more. A little tedious, getting a little blurry eye. Okay, so I think I got through six. We'll start with seven. It's very important that, that I don't touch the tip to anything and cause cross-contamination to the wells. Oops, we're not done with that yet. We just did row A. So now I'm going to do row B. Same thing. Three drops in each well. One, two, three. Okay, I'm going to pause in the middle. And it looks like I need some more. But never fear. I have an extra kit. So I've got some more secondary antibody to put into row B. So, oops, did I pause after six? Yes. Okay, so I'm at seven. Mm -hmm. One, two, three. 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 All right, did I hit them all, Dr. Chu? Mm-hmm. So now, secondary antibodies in there. There would be gentle shaking incubation. Then we dump it out, wash it out, so that any of the antibodies that are left in those wells are there because they're sticking to something, not because they're just floating in solution. So now we finally get to the step where we might get to see some color. So we're on step 11 in the protocol. We've got chromogen. The chromogen is the last thing that's added. It's going to interact with the enzyme that's attached to the secondary antibody and produce a color. But remember, only if that secondary antibody is stuck in the well. 
So I'm going to start with row A and do what I've been doing. One, two, three. One, two, three. Okay, so I did the six, little pause, and then I'll do the next six. One, two, two, three. Well, I need some more, so I'm on ten. Little more. Ten. Eleven. Twelve. I'm going to give that one more drop. Okay. So row A has the chromogen. Now I'm going to add chromogen to row B. Two more. Okay. Hopefully that was all good. I need to grab some white paper. It's going to take, ooh, look, it didn't take too long. Now, the protocol says that you'll see a pale green. I see some pale green in there. It's not always the easiest to see. Number 12 says all the reactions will turn light green when the chromogen is added. There's been some variability on that in my experience. Now, the change from light green to purple will indicate a positive result. And you need a minimum of five minutes and a maximum of 10 minutes to allow for color development. So, wowza, we can already start talking about this a little bit. Well, number one, we must see our positive control turn purple and our negative control not turn purple. Now, it's tempting to look at the other wells, but really, until we've got the positive and negative control working, it doesn't make any sense to look at the other wells. So, we really should give it the five minutes and come back. All right, we are back. The five minute minimum time has elapsed and I want to walk you through our results. Most importantly, the positive control has turned purple. The negative control has stayed clear in all three rows, which is good. That's what we expect unless, you know, I goofed up as I was doing the test. Now, I want to talk briefly about our simulated experiment. So we've got patient A, patient B, patient C, D, E, and F. And looking at this, Patient A is positive, patient B is negative, patient C is negative, patient D is positive, but we're going to call that a weak positive, patient E is negative, patient F is positive. Now, I'm going to let that sit and remind you of what our patient samples were. So the sample in A, here I'll use my pen as a pointer. This was an individual who had traveled on a cruise out of the country. Oh, sorry, here's patient A, silly me. They traveled on a cruise out of the country and they had symptoms consistent with the coronavirus. And as we can see here, they are testing positive for this new coronavirus. Remember, this is just a simulation. Patient B is over here, these three wells. Patient B had taken a trip, airline travel out of the country, and is in self-quarantine. 
they do not have any symptoms and they're coming up negative. Right, over to patient C. Patient C, a couple went on a cruise out of the country, came back, he had symptoms. They didn't get bad enough that he needed medical care. They were self-quarantining in their house and he's recovered now. So they are very curious to know if he had coronavirus and it's turning up negative. So he did not have coronavirus and if enough time has passed for the quarantine after their cruise, they are off the hook for quarantining. Now patient D, patient D went to a St. Patrick's Day party last Saturday. It was St. Patrick's Day weekend at a bar. This was before the governor closed down the bars. So they were in a public space and there were probably, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 people in the bar. It wasn't a large bar, but they were out in the public and exposed to a group of people. At this time, they do not have symptoms, but we can see from this ELISA test that they are testing positive for the coronavirus. So they will be quarantined, hopefully not develop a serious case that needs any additional care, but definitely quarantined, and that'll be reported back to the bar. So anyone who was at the bar that evening needs to know that information. If we move on to patient E, this patient is just someone who lives in Ohio, has minor cold-like symptoms, and is really curious to know if they might have the coronavirus. As we can see from the results of the ELISA test, patient E is testing negative. Okay. Now, our other strong positive here is patient F. Patient F is a healthcare worker that has been working with patients that have tested positive for this new coronavirus. They do have symptoms and they were tested, of course, and they will be remaining in quarantine and anyone the patient interacted with will be quarantined also. So our healthcare worker that has known exposure and some symptoms did test positive to the coronavirus. All right, that's the results of the ELISA test.